Whoa, good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to the Smith Raffel Film Center. Wonderful to see a full house on a Saturday afternoon. Thank, thank you all for joining us for this. My name is Tano Maida, and uh, I'm executive director of the Buddhist Film Foundation, but that's not what brings me here today. Gratitude is something for everybody. So we're gonna have a, an extraordinary uh, program, and in order to gather it all together, uh, we've invited the uh, performance artist, author, teacher, uh, spirit rock Dharma teacher, and a very, very good friend of mine, Nina Wise, to introduce the evening. Please welcome her to the stage. Thank you, everybody. Hi. So I have the honor of introducing Louis Schwartzberg, who most of you know is the filmmaker who made fantastic fungi. I just asked him how to pronounce that. You can say fungi or fungi, but not fungi, just FYI. Um, as I was thinking about doing this this afternoon, I thought about how in a lot of Buddhist teaching, they say you can learn in three ways. You can learn by hearing and studying, you can learn by direct transmission, and you can learn by practice. And I thought the great thing about a film like this is you're getting all of those things at once. That what's happening is a transmission so that we're awakened to actually have an experience. And Louis is so great at that. Yeah, so welcome. Also, this afternoon and early evening, I guess, uh, Lynn Twist will be here, the author, lecturer, and the founder of the Soul of Money Institute, and Christine Carter from the UC Berkeley Center of Greater Good Science Center, it's called. And they're going to join Louis and me for a discussion afterwards. And Louis mentioned to me that he would really love to hear your comments and questions as this film is launched into the world. That sense of its impact for him and all of us is really important. So we hope you stick around. And here's Louis. Thank you, Nina. I just wanted to, to welcome all of you because I feel for me it's a bit of a homecoming. After I graduated UCLA, I lived in Elk, in Mendocino, for several years. And um, I feel like the mycelial network brought us all together. And, and you guys get what I'm talking about. So uh, uh, with that film, it was a journey you know, to go underground, to learn you know, nature's intelligence, how ecosystems can flourish, and with this film, I hope it's a journey within our soul. So enjoy the ride. Thank you. Christine and Louis and, and Lynn all come up here and join us. And uh, we're, I'm going to ask each panelist a uh, for each presenter, whatever you call them, a question, so we can get this started, and then we're going to open it up to comments. And as I said earlier, Louis was really interested in hearing from you, questions, comments, about your experience here this afternoon. So, uh, first, Louis, um, I wanted to ask you uh, what, at this moment in time, really moved you to make this film? Part of it was the pandemic. <laughs> what? I, well, the pandemic meant I couldn't go out and film. Mm -hmm. I've had this in my heart for a long time. And um, also during the pandemic, we were all very much aware of this disconnection from each other, from being able to have dinner with your friends and family, things we took for granted. Um, and this feeling of despair we have with the environmental crisis, the politics, um, so I think the universe has guided me to make the film happen now. Um, and I went into my archive and I basically pulled little magic moments together um, to string together an experience of what gratitude is, on, at least from my own personal point of view, from the remarkable and extraordinary people who I've met in my life, including some of the people that are up here. I'm going to ask you another question. It seems like 
you know, there's so many points of emphasis, it's hard to pull one out. But one of the things I was struck by was the relationship between uh, one's ability to evoke a certain sense of gratitude for one's life and the gifts that have been given and the impact that has on consuming less, destroying less. Could you talk a little bit about that? Well, I think that, you know, Growing up with my parents being Holocaust survivors, I mean, you know, they taught me about all being grateful for all the little things in life, you know, food on the table, a roof over your head, the miracle of having children, a steady job. And I think in response to your question, I think that can not only shape my point of view, my worldview about, you know, being grateful for life in that respect, but also it it shaped me as an environmentalist because it's really the same thing. You know, being grateful for the little guys, the butterflies that, and the bees that give us the healthy food we need to eat, the fungi that make soil for plants to live. Um, the two are really interwoven um, and it's being grateful for things that you don't always appreciate, but when they're gone, then you really notice it. Like for example, when you get sick, you all of a sudden realize how you know grateful you are for your health. There's a trillion cells in your body. They're working in harmony. What a gift. What a miracle. So for me, I think observing nature and you know having the ancestry that I have, I think um, are basically the same story woven together of overcoming adversity but being resilient for life to flourish. That was a really striking moment in the film when it right at the beginning when you talked about your parents being survivors and your mother was at what in Auschwitz for eight years. That you could hear the gas go through the crowd. I know that I felt that too. And so thank you for revealing that as part of this narrative. Yeah, well my mom was an inspiration because you know, she had a lot of joy. She never complained. She 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 worked at a, a senior living home as a cook. She mm-hmm you know, took care of us, fed, cleaned the house. And I swear to God, never once did she ever say she was tired. She was a real, like, you know, Yiddish mama that kicked butt. And um, it's like, and all my friends loved her. She didn't speak English as well, you know, I was in elementary school, but they all wanted to come to my house because she'd always, she'd feed you. Um, and, you know, they just loved her because she had this great smile. And only as I got older did I really ever really understand how incredible that is because you hear other people complain and whine about, you know, their past or how they were, their parents yelled at them. <laughs> uh, so I, I do appreciate, you know, people that are um, able to, you know, have that um, zest for life regardless of what they went through. You know, there's a lot of discussion these days about epigenetic trauma and from the Holocaust and in a way it seems like you've take in whatever landed in you in that way and really uh, became an alchemist and transformed it into this kind of beauty and inspiration. So. Well, it's, it's something I think we all have to, I, I have to work on, I know, because it's really easy for me to feel like a victim. Mm-hmm. You know, it's easy for me to go there, but I eventually learned late in life, even when things are, you know, grossly unjust, that it doesn't help to be a victim because I'm just hurting myself. Mm-hmm. Um, so I have to, you know, develop that muscle to to be positive. And I think in this movie, you you learn the fact that it takes effort to, you know, um, not be manipulated by fear, um, to be able to understand that that's a knee jerk reaction, and you have to really work hard to, you know, get out of that negative spiral and and find something that you're grateful for. So that's been a savior for me. Because, you know, that happens to me all the time. I feel bad. I get rejected. I can feel myself going into a negative spiral and then go, wow, what could I be grateful for? You know, my fingers are moving. I can walk. Um, look at the light bouncing off that tree over there. I mean, it stops the negative energy from ruminating in my brain. And it's something that I constantly have to work on. Mm-hmm. Interesting. So, yeah. You know, it's helpful to hear that. Uh, because I think sometimes we feel like we're supposed to feel grateful and we're not feeling it. And Christine and I talked a little bit about that in the 
lobby at the beginning and wanted to ask you about that in your work at the, maybe you can tell us. The Greater Good Science the, Center. <laughs> that's a lot of words, the Greater Good Science Center. I love those words all put together, the Greater Good Science. Okay, good, there's a science to this. Um, so you were saying in some of your work that um, people feel obligated now, you know, with all the science about happiness and, and gratefulness, we're supposed to feel happy and we're supposed to feel good. And then we start feeling worse that we're not feeling happy and yeah, grateful. We so. actually feel sort of sad and, um, and then we feel bad about feeling sad. And so we, we renew this effort, right, to feel grateful. And um, I think it's important to acknowledge that sometimes it can be hard. And uh, it really is an effort. It's, it's a job to be done, but it's a harder job when we feel like we have to feel grateful, right? That we should feel grateful because there's this sort of expectation and element of force that co comes in that we, our inner teenager is going to rebel against, right? It needs to be something that emerges from within us. And for that to emerge, a lot of the time, we just have to let ourselves feel. And um, we are so adept. We have so many technologies now that distract us from how we're feeling. It's easy to become overwhelmed or to feel numb. And so when we're having a hard time feeling a true, authentic sense of gratitude, a lot of the time, the best thing that we can do is to just let us, ourselves feel whatever else is actually there usually we do have to let ourselves feel sad first, you know? And then ultimately, you know, if, if it's sadness that comes up, we let ourselves feel that sadness. Um, a lot of the time we can feel grateful for the sadness itself, right? And probably we sustained a loss. That meant we really loved someone or something and that can evoke the feeling of gratitude. I think that's such an important point that um, sometimes to feel grateful, we have to first surrender to feeling sad or disappointed. Uh, there's a Talmudic teaching that goes, um, a broken heart is the gateway to heaven. Mm -hmm. We have to move through that first. And there's, I think there's misunderstanding. Or Thich Nhat Hanh says that the key to happiness is letting go of happiness. Yeah. It's complex. So I know you wanted me to um, mention that you have a book. You have many books, and um, that you have a book called Raising Happiness. And so if you all want to learn more about this or have some help, I think this, the idea of effort, gratitude and effort, they seem so contradictory, and yet um, they're interrelated. But it's a kind of effortless effort, right? It's it's a it's a letting go um, that can then allow these other things to arise. So Lynn, um, you also have a new book out, Living a Committed Life, Finding Freedom and Fulfillment in a Purpose Larger Than Yourself. And that's also such a key to feeling gratitude is letting go of um, what the Tibetans call self-cherishing. You know, so you, that's an effort. You let go of self-cherishing and um, there was so much in the movie about that, about people helping other people. And that's where that sense of happiness and gratitude arises. So maybe you want to talk a little about that? Uh, well, I, I just, first of all, just love the film. I, I hadn't seen it. And um, it's beautiful, Louis. You're just, you're, you're genius. <laughs> And um, we were trying to remember when we got interviewed. This isn't your question, but I just want to say this. And I think it's eight years ago. It's a long time that this has lived in his heart. Um, and as you know, he's a, as you all know, he's a spectacular filmmaker, has probably zillions and zillions and zillions of uh, photographs and footage. And somehow that this all emerged and bubbled up and became a coherent piece of work. It's very, very moving. Um, so thank you, thank you. I'm grateful for the film. <laughs> um, I think uh, Louis is an example of what I wrote about in my book or what I 
um, talk about, which is that if you discover that you're here uh, now, as Paul Hawkins said in the film, at this epic, amazing, extraordinary time in history, you have a role to play, or you wouldn't be here. And it's not a big role or a small role, it's just yours. And really, I think what we're all looking for is finding that role so we can play our hearts out and be grateful for the privilege of being alive at a time when we can have such meaningful lives. And, um, you know, we say in the Pachamama Alliance uh, Symposium, and I know a lot of people here uh, that you've taken that course, that the, um, the times we're living in are so challenging, and the choices we make each day, just the simple choices we make impact the future of life for the next 1,000 years. And you would think, well, that's a burden. But no, as my husband Bill, who's here, said, is it ennobles you. It ennobles your life and gives you the chance to live a life of meaning, which I think that's what people want more than anything, is to know that they matter, that their life matters. So the, um, the book, and, and actually this film, is, is very much um, consistent with it, is that uh, I think, Louis, you were called to make this film. <laughs> And I think we're all called. Um, anybody who would show up for this, this film and this theater today, probably it's not an accident that you're here, uh, that you're called to something larger than yourself, that you're called to be useful, to make a difference. Um, and just, I'm just thinking of all the moments of Norman Lear and Jack Cornfield and the wisdom, which I think ultimately comes from living a life larger than yourself because you need the wisdom, and you find it so that you can be uh, of use, you can be of service, when you have a commitment that you can never take credit for, that maybe nobody will ever know that you did it, your, your life becomes uh, something that's, you're an instrument of something. And then that uh, overwhelming experience of as I say in the film, great fullness, which is the source of the word gratefulness, the great fullness of being useful, the great fullness of being in tone, in tune with what's wanted, what's needed, what's being called for, is, is thrilling, it's, it's, it's indescribable. It's being in touch with source. So I think that's what we're all looking for, and when we find it, we're grateful, and we're grateful in the search and being grateful leads you there. So it's all related. Intertwined, interrelated, yeah. All right, well, let's open it up to you all. I'm sure you have many feelings, impressions, probably questions that arise in the mind. The film is complex and profound. And so I believe we have someone in the aisle who will be bringing a microphone, is that correct? Um, and if not, we ask you to stand up and speak clearly so we can all hear you. And if you, yes, I see you back there. Uh, you can address your question to everyone in general or anyone in particular. So way back there, yes. Thank you. Uh, Gordon Lambert, this is Carol. Thank you. I, I want to say you asked for some comments. I think you have some superpowers in your, thank you. Uh, the selections of the faces. Everyone gets moved so deeply. It's like you understand what's going on in that expression, in that soul, and, and you align and the timing of it. It's, it's just you're, you're such a master of the visual and the uplift. And I think you deliver the audiences over and over again. And this was just tremendous. Uh, so thank you. Thank you. The, the, the comment about the film that came to me was about the, the title and everything that it gave. It had so many things. It was patience and lack of you know, fear, creativity, humor. And gratitude was just sort of like an icing piece. And from my life, I don't use gratitude like you do to, to, come, to come out of... Uh, darkness. It's not that important for me. It's a, the great fullness is what I experience as my natural state, but not gratitude. And so I was looking for gratitude 
themes throughout, and I was seeing all these other things about uplifting life here and uplifting life here. And to me, that was from my, perp my personal experience, I would have liked, I would have preferred to come in and a movie about uplifting life with gratitude as the, you know, the icing. Because I was looking for gratitude and trying to figure out how are you going to bring this into gratitude and how are you going to bring this into gratitude. But it was all just uplifting life and then at the end there was gratitude towards life. So, which is, as I say, I, it, that's where I didn't feel as connected to the film. I felt connected to every aspect of it. Just wanted to pass that. For me, I think I'm just trying to, you know, make a film that celebrates life. Yes. I'm not an expert on or in, in psychology, but these were all the things that, for me, added up to gratitude, and I feel that um, all of it is really life affirming. Um, but again, it's my own personal, you know, journey, and these are people who I bumped into on my on the road, literally at times, mm -hmm. and um, so your, you know view of, of what gratitude is, is as valid as everybody else's in this audience, and I welcome that. I'm not an expert, and I'm, I'm just grateful that I was able to record these magic moments over time, and I could put it together like little pearls on a necklace, and thank God it kind of worked, and, and I, my job is just to turn you on to be on your own journey. And when you said celebrating life, it's like that's what it felt like for me. This film was celebrating life. Yeah. And that's, that, that, that was exactly the alignment with me. That's it's too late to change the title, but I'll think about it. <laughs> <laughs> let's, uh, let's open it up to some more um, questions. Let's see. Okay. Um, yes, you here right in the middle. Yes. Nina, this question is for you, oh. <laughs> um, uh -uh. which is in the very beginning, when you introduced the film, you said there were three aspects of the film that came together, which were the last one was practice, and then I don't know what it was, insight, uh, articulation, and there was something else. And it really helps me to frame this all. Mm. Um, it helps me get grounded, know how to take this in, and know how to digest it. So if all of you could somehow fill me in on what you said. I'm not entirely sure I understand the question. I can reiterate that what I, one of the teachings in Buddhism is that you, in particular, well, many, that you can, the, a student learns in three ways. One is by hearing the teaching or reading. One is by practicing. So when you meditate or do whatever practices you do, chanting, bowing. Um, and the third is pure transmission. And what I am so um, thrilled at, I think art in a way does all of those, or Louis art filmmaking, because we're hearing the teachings, the words, we're, having the experience of the, um, the practice of sitting and watching as a kind of meditation with these kinds of films. And then there's a transmission of the, you know, when you're looking at music and looking at imagery and hearing those teachings, it's immersive. And I think that's a really spectacular thing about Louis filmmaking, other spiritual films, that they kind of work on all those fronts at once. And you don't have to work so hard, you can just sit there. <laughs> That's what I wanted. Okay, good. Okay, yes, um, the woman here in the white shirt. Hi. Hi. Thanks. Um, first, I want to say I was so delighted to see the longer film because I've been watching the 19 minute version. Five minute. Oh, okay. Well, the five minute related okay. to the TED Talk. For you, it's not like forever, <laughs> but that's great. <laughs> it's just so, um, in, yeah. you know. There's so much uh, receptivity that I get from this in this transmission and this invitation to sort of open our viewpoint. But along those lines, one of the things I noticed was the comment around, you know, with the TED Talk and taking people on a journey. And there was a theme in the film around pieces that were surprising, including grief, as an element of gratitude. 
And one of the things that really stood out this time was challenge as a pathway. And I see potential for a film like this to influence our culture and our ability to make the changes that we have in our hearts and that we're wanting to bring in fruition to the world, but that we feel powerless about. And I just wanted to kind of invite more insight around the quality of challenge and the, um, and the um, opportunity you know, that you see. I mean, I, I see all three of you sort of influenced in this way. So, you know, through your work, I would just be interested to hear how this kind of film can influence those of us receiving and wanting to participate as activists. Well, the, the <laughs> this is like day two of the release of the movie. <laughs> and so there's a challenge, like how are we gonna make this be global, you know? So actually on Wednesday, um, on um, World Gratitude Day, it's going to be available, you know, globally. Um, if you go to gratitudeveal.com, you can, you'll find the times and dates. We're going to do an early morning one because I want to get Europe involved and in that time zone. So I'm going for it, you know. And then North America. Um, the last time, you know, we did something like this with Fantastic Fug Guy. We had, you know, 20,000, 30,000 people connect. So um, I want to replicate the mycelial network around the globe. And I feel like hopefully this little nugget of a, of a film, which is digital, and we're using digital in a positive way, can you know, um, inspire all of us. And, and so I have a challenge right now. Uh, we all have a challenge. Actually, I'll give the challenge to you because you, sh you guys showed up here, which is wonderful. We sold out the theater, no marketing and no advertising. Thank you, thank you. So, tell a friend, tell a bunch of friends, you know, about the film, because it's happening organically. I don't have, a, there's no studio, we're doing this on our own, because there's nobody that would buy this movie, to be honest, you know? Nobody wanted to buy Fantastic Fungi, and we were number one on Apple, you know, TV. You know, we cracked the top 10, yet I couldn't, you know, crack through the, you know, to the typical entertainment world, which is based on fear and violence and pressing those buttons that are easy to press, but it's a lot harder to have people laugh and cry and fall in love. And so there is an audience, you are the audience, and there's, there's way more of us than we believe, right? Or that we think. I bet there's a lot of us, you know? And, and the film goes, it shows that there's a people in red states and we're in a blue state, but guess what? We're just all another version of each other. We all want the same thing. There, there is no, this polarization thing. It's just, you know, negative energy on the extreme fringes of media on edges of left or right, whatever it is. But when you hang out with people, man, they're beautiful, you know? And everybody here was beautiful from, you know, Midwest to Mississippi to you name it, you know, they're all just like all of us. Anyway, so I hope that will be a powerful message in terms of getting over this, you know, uh, polarization we're in right now. And um, I'm swinging for the fences that it'll be global. That's the challenge. You know, how do we share this message? You know, both Lynn and Christine are, you know, write books. We want everyone to be, they're, they're putting it out there. It's the transmission that you talk about. So we're gonna put out that good energy and, and feel that the universe has our back. And we're gonna draft off of it, because now's the time to do it. The clock is ticking. This is a different time in, 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 our, in our history than ever, where we can't just say, well, we'll wait a couple of generations for it to evolve, you know? No, this is, it's now or never on the environmental issue for sure. And so, um, yeah, let's all take that challenge. Let's all be Jedi warriors. I think that that is the great hope and the great power of a film like this. The clock is ticking and we have any number of challenges ahead of us. And we as a culture have become so focused on pursuing comfort and um, addressing all of these challenges is incredibly uncomfortable. And what's so inspiring and enlightening about this film is that element of challenge that you pointed out 
that um, through embracing discomfort, embracing life's natural difficulties, and by looking squarely at the challenges that we are facing, well, will arise as something so much better than comfort, mm -hmm. right? It's and these challenges that we heard Michael Beck with, basically, they're blessings in disguise. And every time somebody dumps you and you look back, you go, that was a good thing, you know? <laughs> and, you know, somebody, you get fired from a job and you go, oh, shit, and then you go, wow, I'm glad, you know, that happened. You know, like I found a better opportunity. So that, I love that it's not trite, you know, that these things are blessings in disguise, you know? And every time you go over that hump, when you look backwards, you go, oh, I'm so grateful. Yeah, I, I'll, I'm going to add something because um, one of the wonderful things that Paul Hawken, I think, has taught many of us, he says that the climate crisis is not happening to us, that we're not the victims, and that we have to be terrified of it. Obviously, it's hugely terrifying, but it's happening for us because we need a disruption so deep, so sacred, so something we can't manipulate to wake up from being on a trajectory that's inconsistent with the future of life. And the indigenous people of the Amazon that we work with at Pachamama Alliance say the same thing. They, they say that humanity has been yearning and waiting for something powerful and sacred enough to, to help us to stop. And, and they say that's the pandemic too, that it came to, uh, even though there's horrible suffering and people died and we lost friends and relatives, and I don't want to step over that, but when you think about the power of that, those two years of the whole world, only one species though, not others, being afraid of getting sick or getting sick, what, what was that? What, was, what is the larger way of looking at that? And then I wanted to say also to you, because I loved your question, it is, it is imp really important to, to almost deepen our capacity for grief, I think. Um, to really feel now what's going on. Because the deeper we're, we're able to grieve and, and feel the, the true sadness and despair in many ways of the, of the world that we're in right now and the challenges we face, the greater the capacity for joy and power and, um, and, and productivity and capacity to meet it. So it, it's like in every breakdown, the seeds of a breakthrough, much greater than the breakdown, are always there. But you have to find them. You have to trust, uh, which I thought that was so wonderful, that you have to trust. You have to trust, and if you trust, You'll find them, you'll see them, you'll water them, and they'll take you through the breakdown into the breakthrough. And I feel like this, that's what the whole world is in right now. Or I'd like to look at it that way anyway, because it, it, I don't know that any generation of humankind has ever faced what we're facing. Uh, at the same time, we must be up to it if it weren't here. That's what I say. <laughs> Okay, I think that um, we need to wrap up. So why don't we give another round of applause to you. Thank you all for coming. Thank you all for bringing your heart and soul and awakened mind to this and do help spread the word. Thank you. Gratitude. <laughs>